This is the second part of the interview with Keith Hackett and the third interview on uh, farposthedder.com. This is uh, going to cover the career of Keith. Uh, last time we touched on various different aspects of the mm. game and this will be sort of more specific to uh, your career, Keith. How are you anyway? Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, um, difficult times, obviously. Uh, with regard to uh, COVID-19 that we've all suffered. And uh, I'm pleased that at grassroots level, they're beginning to play some friendly matches, although we're not allowed to watch them, um, so, which is a disappointment. So Penniston Church, I'm the president uh, there, the club, I played a friendly one on Monday, and I think they've got, they're playing Sheffield FC on Saturday and Sheffield FC of course are the uh, oldest football club in the world so yes. it's always nice when we get the opportunity to play the oldest club football club in the world. Is that um, an annual yeah. football friendly? Pardon? Is that an yeah. annual friendly between the two teams? Well I, I think that like most clubs in South Yorkshire I think we we build relationships up and I think we've got quite a good relationship with Sheffield FC as we have with Emily which is um, another team that we play regularly at friendlies and then our rival Stocksbridge Park Steels. So Stocksbridge Park Steels in the higher division. But all aimed at getting players fit. I mean, uh, they haven't played for some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, done, we've done quite well. I mean, we actually operate with 22 teams, believe it or not. So wow. there are a lot of children and, and, and a lot of grown-ups that have been missing football. And we're still held by by restrictions. I mean, one of the things we wanted to do is film and stream the friendly game on Saturday um, to a lot of people in, in the in the sort of Penistone area. Sadly, the FA won't allow us to do that on a live stream. Amazing, oh, isn't it? Why is that exactly? I don't know. I mean, uh, I've not uh, got to the bottom of it yet. I mean, uh, I would have thought that um, for some people who have been in lockdown and who haven't seen football for a spell and not going to see football other than on TV, giving them the opportunity of their, watching their local club is something that ought to be a positive rather than negative. Definitely. What, do, what division are uh, Penniston Church in at the moment? They're in the Premier Division of the Northern Counties East League. So they, I don't know what level it is, step whatever. Right. But um, it, it's, um, it's pretty good football. Uh, we've uh, got a lot of local players. Mm. We get probably, last year, I think we averaged something like 250 spectators per game, uh, which is great. To, good crowd. Uh, and then I think on one occasion, the previous season, on one occasion we played Works Up Town at, on, on what was effectively a promotion game. And, and we, we broke the record the number of spectators at that at that particular level so it was played at works up town so we i think i, I forgot the number but it, was, it was probably close to 1500 which That's is a really it was a good crowd brought in a fair amount of income for the for works of town mm. yes. I, fo I follow um aldershot and we get uh we moved up the pyramid of the uh, non-league uh starting at ismian level three so i think that was at the time that was the fifth tier of yeah. And that was the sort of crowds that were being uh, that were got by the other teams. And then when Aldershot would come along, the crowds would be up tenfold. So you get two and a half thousand in. Yeah. Uh, I think that's great when, when you see um, a rise of a club. You know, I mean, uh, we, we a couple of years ago, I think we played Harrogate Town in, in, in the FA Cup. Mm. Uh, they, they knocked us out. And it... it you know, you could see that the ambition in the in that particular club was amazing. You know, a builder uh, who a developer, should I say, who obviously sunk a fair amount of money into the club, and his son was the manager. Oh. And um, and in fact, you know, it's had it's had great success. Now it's a football league club, and they 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 operated on a four G pitch, and um, They've now got to dig that up. Mm. 
um, you know, to play at football league level. It seems a bit crazy, really, when you watch Scottish football and they play on 4G. Yeah. So, you know, you suddenly say, well, come on. I can remember the days of refereeing at uh, Queen's Park Rangers and at Luton. They weren't, they weren't the best pitchers because they were the old Astroters. Yes. Infancy. So it was a bit hard work refereeing on it. It was a little bit like running on concrete. But nonetheless, when you look at 4G now, and I've seen that in Iceland, I've seen it in various areas because of weather, mm. how good a material it is. You know, and you suddenly go, why, why does the competition not allow uh, a club like Arrogate to keep its uh, playing surface? Definitely. Beyond me. Yeah, they um, they had they had the turf like you say in the eighties at at Luton and uh, QPR, and I interviewed um, Peter Hucker, the former QPR goalkeeper. Yeah. He said it was just, like you say, just like concrete, diving on concrete, and yeah. So. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I never envied the goalkeepers. I know that the following day, when, when you'd refereed it at either club, um, you, you ate, mm. you know, the, the ankles uh, ate because you were, you were putting in a fair amount of sprinting yeah. on what was effective concrete. And, and you ought to be wary that when the long ball was kicked, it would bounce over the head of the centre-half and finish up in the goalkeeper's hands on the other side of the pitch. Yeah. So you had to adjust. Exactly. Um, if I could start by asking about your uh, refereeing career in the football league, when when did that start, and where did what, what level were you refereeing to begin with? Well, I mean, I I, I think it was round about seventy two. I went on as a as a football league linesman as a call then, and then after a couple of three years, they um, put me on to the what was then a supplementary list. So that you knew that you got a number of games to prove that you were good enough at football league level. And, and I did, uh, I mean, my first game uh, that I refereed on the football league, I can remember it was, uh, it was Stockport County versus Northampton. And you remember that because, you know, it, it, it's something that that's your first game on football league. And uh, the game went very well for me. I, it, was, uh, it was enjoyable. The teams were good and behaved and uh, I was very pleased that um, to get that under my under my belt and then and then of course you have to remember then what what happened was you effectively operated in division two and three to to get bedded in yes. and you all by Christmas or after Christmas in that one season you'd be getting you'd get a first division match Already, so, so yeah, that's how it worked. And I think my first first division match was Liverpool versus Wolves at, at Anfield or at Molyneux at Anfield. All oh, right, so refereeing in front well, of the cop. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been there, obviously running the line. So it was you were familiar with Anfield, but you know, mm. stepping out into the amphitheater of uh, Liverpool and the atmosphere was terrific. And I, I guess with some referees it might crease them, but for me it was a lift. Yeah. I always loved I always loved going to like the big clubs. But I also kept my feet on the ground because as I said to someone a couple of weeks ago, I, I would, you know, I would referee international games or football league or Premier League games if I got a spare day on the week at the weekend, mm. even if it was a Saturday I'd referee the Premier League game, I would referee in the local parks on a Sunday. Oh really? Absolutely. So I would I would referee. Uh, I can remember on one occasion refereeing um, Germany v Italy in the Euros '88. In in 1988, I refereed uh, Germany Italy, West Germany then, as it was called, v Italy. And uh, the following Saturday uh, or Sunday morning, I was at Blackpool Taverners against the Angel. Two pub teams. <laughs> It's a complete stark yeah. contrast in matches and, and, then. You know, you'd be in the dressing room, they'd throw the ball at you and, it's, and the way you went. But, wow. you know, that, 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 you know, I did it and, and I was really pleased that Uriah Rennie, who comes from this area, he did it when he was a Premier League referee and Howard Webb. Mm. You know, Howard Webb would often run uh, referee a couple of school teams. That he keeps you planted, but it also 
you know, in a way, it keeps you helps keep you fit. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine, and sort of it would be be terrible to be sort of the other way around, maybe refereeing a Sunday league game and then turning your ankle or something just before a European Championships game or something like that. Well, I, I, I think that's always, yeah, I, I think you take each game as it comes. For me, the next game was the most important. Mm. And, it, you know, once or twice people would say, come on, Keith, in the in local pub teams, they come on, Keith, it's not the FA Cup final. And you go, well, it is actually. Mm. And they go, what do you mean? Well, it's, you know, this is, I'm putting my reputation at risk here to officiate you. So, yeah, you, your expectation is I'm going to referee as I'm refereeing the world, the, the FA Cup, and that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I did. So it was always, always enjoyable. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that, I think most referees are that way in time. I think there are a lot of referees. I'm, I'm not sure about the modern referee uh, because of the demands placed upon them. Mm. You know, they, they have a Premier League game. Um, there's all sorts of sports science that I introduced. I brought the sports scientists into the referee. As a consequence, we know that if they've had a game on a Saturday, then Sunday they've got to recover. They've got to do either a recovery run, go for a swim or whatever, but they're in recovery mode. Yeah. Hardly likely then to be encouraged to, uh, to go out and do another game. It must also be quite strange for the... Uh the Sunday league player to have a Premier League referee who's, you know, you're, they're used to seeing playing, uh, sorry, refereeing a big match and then all of a sudden they're then refereeing their game at the local park on the Sunday. Well, I always used to meet that by saying, look, this is where I started and this is where I'll finish in terms of refereeing, the refereeing career. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I bump into people now that, have stopped playing and and uh, I refereed during the period. They're very complimentary. I think they were always surprised. Um, but I'll tell you a story. On one occasion, I had um, had a, a Premier League game uh, down at Arsenal on uh, on the Wednesday night and uh, travelled back home. Didn't have a game on the Saturday and took a game on a Sunday in Concord Park, which is well known in Sheffield, he's got something like 26 pitches. And so you go into the dressing room and you've got, you know, you've got 26 referees in this in a fairly large changing area. Mm. And uh, the secretary come in and said, uh, Nicky, we've got our game, you're on pitch one. I go, fine, no problem. You know where it is? Yes, I know where it is. And um, I strode out straight on the pitch, blew the whistle, refereeing for about 20 minutes. And then there was a, a referee with two flags still at the side of the pitch. And so I thought, well, you can run a line because you don't have linesmen. So I thought, oh, I'll get him to run me a line, make life easier. I went across and said to him, oh, do you fancy running me the line? He goes, no, you're on my pitch. And I go, this is, this is pitch one. And he goes, no, it isn't. This is pitch three. The park superintendent changed the names and numbers of the pitches oh, of, the, of the week, and I've gone, oh god! So I'd actually refereed a match for twenty minutes um, on the wrong pitch, which I always <laughs> smile about. Yeah, well, they always say that referees need to have glasses or something. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's proof there. And um, how how did you cope with the big name players? Did that, that would they have had sort of the the bigger ego and sort of have to? Do you, no, you have think, to treat them differently? Well, I think that... No, I think that what, as a referee, what you have to do is treat all players the same, if that's feasible. And, of course, I mean, one of the, one of the things is that, um, you know, a, a referee has got the best seat in the house because he's on the pitch with people who he admires and respects. And, like, yeah. you're looking at, you know... And, you know, George Best, uh, Bobby Charlton, Maradona, Platini, uh, uh, Glenn Hoddle, you know, Mark, uh, Wright, uh, you know, Tony Adams. And you've refereed um, each and every one of those players. Yeah, so, you, you know, you, you run through it all. I mean, I, I, you know, Carlos Alberto, uh, Michel Platini, uh, Karl Heinz Rummenigge. So um, you see them and they're there 
um, and you hope that they will express their skill set and that you will, in effect, treat them just like any other player on the pitch and they'll behave. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you, uh, you've got to deal with them because ultimately, at the end of the day, you're the guy in charge of the game. You've got to control them. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes that means a different approach. Uh, that might be a firm word, but I, you know, I always used uh, rather than saying the next time you're going to do that, I'm going to yell a card you. Um, you know, I was brought up in the 60s, and the yellow and red cards weren't introduced till 1970. So I've been refereeing for 10 years without red and yellow cards. Mm. So you you knew for well that you know it wasn't next time I'm going to caution you, or next time you're going to get sent off. You learned to say, look, I want an improvement. From you, and that left your options open as much as it, it did theirs. But I mean, um, when you when you actually are on the same pitch as um, as the players, you then realise how skillful they were, mm-hmm. and um, and how much effort they put in. I mean, one of my favourite players that I refereed was Kenny Dalgleish, and the reason I liked him and and admired him was that he just put in a 100% effort in every game, you know? And then you look at people like, you know, you, you compare Lee Gary Lineker when he was at Everton and, and I refereed him there and, and probably at Leicester as well. But he never had a yellow card. Mm. You never came across him in a match. You knew he put the ball in the back of the net, but he never argued with it. You know, he just his concentration was on the game. Mm. And then, and then you had the challenges with people like Andy Gray and and Alan Shearer and Malcolm McDonald, um, and and you knew that these people were a hundred percenters. You know, they gave everything. Mm. Uh, there was no, they didn't need motivating. They were motivated, and you knew if they said something to you and they weren't, on, they were unhappy with the decision. Maybe they they were seeing it right and I was seeing it wrong. That puts, you know, the, that puts the doubt in your mind, does it? Well, no, it doesn't put a doubt. It, it actually says, look, you know, I'm not saying that there's a dishonesty in the game now compared with the past, but I think that there was a level of honesty uh, in relation to how they behave. You know, if they're going to clog somebody, they would do. Yeah. You, you, you know, if you, if you were refereeing Wimbledon, you had to keep your eyes on them, you know? And and you know you know that Vinnie Jones had a had a reputation, but in fairness, he was a tough tackler, but he was generally a fair tackler. Mm. You knew that you know you knew that um, you know John Fashion, probably the most articulate player that I've ever come across. But you know full well that he sailed a bit with his arms. Yes, you Gary know? Mabbott would know all about that. Yeah, well, I'd refereed that match. Oh, were you? Yeah. So. Uh, that's why I made that observation because you know a referee has to see these things, and on that occasion I didn't. Oh, and so <laughs> sorry to bring I it up. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things in refereeing is is that you have to see the incident to be able to penalise it. Exactly. And and I always, you know, somebody said because uh, I had the Arsenal Man United blow up as we talked about in the past. Yes. Where, where both clubs was had suspension, and somebody said to me. You could have sent all 21 off. And I went, absolutely, I could. Mm. But I didn't. And somebody says to me, why didn't you? Because, weren't that a bit weak? And I go, no, it was because of my honesty. And they go, I don't understand it. I go, listen, who do I select? Where's the fairness in me picking two players and giving one from each team a red card? Mm. When there's more than one. And he calmed down within 20 seconds. But then it... At the hearing, we, we were able to say, look, um, you know, they found both clubs guilty and, and they were deducted points. Not something I was happy about. But the you, you were, great, were you against that decision for the uh, points deduction? Not necessarily, not necessarily, because I think that the, the, the worry in football was that mass confrontations were difficult for any referee to control. And they suddenly said, well, we've got a six foot two referee here and probably one of the most experienced referees on the list. Mm. And this has happened. We can, we've got to protect the referees as much as the players from each other. Mm. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to find them heavily. And on this occasion, it worked. Yeah. Because, you know, for a period of time, we didn't have mass confrontation. So, and in, and in the case of the Mabbott one, the disappointment was that I'd not seen it. Of course, uh, uh, our dealers, who was the manager then at the time, went absolutely berserk. And remember, I'd have freedom in, in the, in the gun final. But that didn't stop him having to go. And, and I just said to him, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Um, and of course, the FA then brought a charge against Fashion Who, and I and I went to the went to the hearing. It was a very fair hearing, and um, and I and I think that um, Fashion Who was potentially going to lose the case. But let me say, this is when he was articulate. He was well prepared, and. Um, and the outcome was that um, I thought he was going to get fined and suspended. But amazingly, we went out of the room for a break, came back in the room, and Gary Mabbott said, I want this stopped because on no occasion would a professional player do this level intentionally, this, this injury. And that was it. End of the matter. Yeah. The, the case stopped there, and I thought that was absolutely magnanimous uh, gesture from uh, from Gary Mavitt. But that, that was him as an individual, great player to, ref to, to referee, like Ola was. I mean, very, very skillful players. Mm. And then, you know, you look at the goalkeepers, like Ray Clements of, of, of Liverpool and, and, uh, and, and many others. So, you know, you, those are all individual personalities, all all with a task to do, all hoping that, you know, I don't think they had to worry too much about referees then. No, I don't they, think, you know, I think Leeds United had the, did their own work. They knew exactly who the referee was and what they were going to do. Um, but I think most clubs just thought, right, we know this referee today is strict, or we know this referee, you can give him a bit and he'll be a bit fair. Mm. But I think that's how far it went. I think players suddenly went, well, we don't, we don't know who the referee is. We just want to get on with the game. Yeah. And we could, have, we could have good banter with them. You know, they, they, you know, hey, ref, are you sure about that one? I think you got that one wrong, that decision. I go, hey, just a minute. I'll just watch you pop the ball over the, over the bar when you should have put it in the back of the net. And they'd smile. Yeah. That's, that's a nice edge to it, I guess. Sort of. but, but of course, when you, when you went into Europe, um, you know for a while then that there were a lot of players who didn't speak the English language. So you developed body, body language skills and presence and various other signals and your communication became more facial, more animated as a referee to get the message across. That's what I was going to come to. Was, uh, you mentioned those good players that you'd refereed in the past, the Maradona, the Carlos Alberto, Romaniga, and to those that are, don't speak English as their first language, was that like, like you've just mentioned about like the more articulate the, uh, uh, body language and things? What what other methods of communication did you use to get your point across or to? Well, I, think, I, I, I think the classic one is, um, and, and I see referees using it more frequently now, and that is your two hands palm down. And you're actually saying, calm down, calm down. Mm. And they understand that. But, but the, other, the other side of it is to be accurate with your decision making, so they're not in your face. You knew for well that if you were refereeing any Italian team, uh, and I've refereed a few of those, and even a national team, you knew that whatever decision you gave in and around the penalty area, be it in the box or just outside, you would have player confrontation. You knew that. And so what what you did was you didn't look at any individual. Okay. All you did was all you did was get on with it, getting the ball placed and the free kick. Mm. You know, because you knew that if you caution one, and yeah, you can do that. And I did that on occasions, but you knew then again you're gonna finish up with two or three. Because mm. once you set that benchmark, and you can ask anybody, if I set that benchmark, that was it. That was the law, and I had to apply the law. Then the law would be applied. Mm. So there was, there was, you know. But 
I think if you're in the right position, you make the right decision, they'll get on with it. If you're caught short, you know, as, as in the fashion who mattered situation, then players will surround you and say, didn't you see it? And I go, no, I didn't. What happened? And they look at you and go, what? You're the referee. You're supposed to see these things. And uh, my answer would be, look, I ain't got eyes in my backside. Maybe I should have a transplant <laughs> and run off. <laughs> so those are the sort of conversations you used to have with players. Did you ever um, hear, I'm, I'm sure you would have done, been able to but pick out individual things from the crowd when people express, say, express their displeasure of uh, your decisions? Or? No, yeah, no, um, I, no, because it, it's crowd noise. If you're in the local park, you could, you know, yeah. one man and his dog or one woman has come to watch his son play. I think it, you know, I think it does touch on a subject there that makes life for young referees now is much more difficult than in my time. I mean, I refereed for probably 10, 12 years at grassroots level. And, you know, only if it was a semi-final or final would you get a crowd. Mm. You wouldn't have parents coming to watch their children. But then you wouldn't be refereeing and you wouldn't have kids at such a young age playing that you have now, mm. you know? And so those would be concentrated purely as school school games. Now, of course, it, you know, I mean, I mean, in Sheffield, we have the Sheffield and District Junior. Oh. I think it's actually the biggest junior league in the world. I think it's got, I think it, it's got something like 1,500 clubs. I mean, most of, most of South Yorkshire, Sheffield, if you like, is occupied on a Sunday morning with their teams playing. And, and you know, around the pitch, sometimes there's not a space for a parent to stand. But the one thing is, I mean, that, that, that particular competition um, deals quite successfully with, uh, with parent uh, misbehaviour. Mm. you know or officials misbehaving in terms of you know potential but you know with the rise in assaults on referees is, is a problem you know how how did you cope um you know with with that sort of abusive language uh, or physical confrontation almost from players as well as people well, I think, in the crowd I think, well i think from the crowd you ignore it hmm. You know, you ignore it. I think with from players, um, then I wouldn't ignore it. A look would be sufficient. Mm. Generally, a look would be, uh, you know, and I would say, look, it's Sunday morning. Sunday morning. We don't, you know, we don't have that. Or I'd say to somebody, um, we've not met before. You know, you go, what? We've not met before. Have you not heard? I've got quite a reputation. And just move away. <laughs> you know? And so you'd leave them second guessing. That's one way of doing that, I suppose. <laughs> well, I think sometimes, uh, you know, don't spoil my Sunday morning. I've come to enjoy what I'm doing. Hmm. I think lots of tags. But I think, I think what you do is you learn to actually pick out very quickly the guy, the, the player in that particular team that, that seems to have got sometimes a better handle than the captain of the team. And you run alongside and say, I think you need to have a word with your number five. He's getting a bit vociferous. He's obviously had a bad night or he's got out the wrong side of the bed. Can you put him straight? And you developed all those sorts of things. You, you mentioned there uh, about um, talking to the captain. That's something that they do in rugby, don't they? They the referee would only speak to the captain. Do you think that should be something that should be implemented in football, or do you think that... Yes, I do. They... I, I think I feel very strongly that the line of communication should be through the captain. You know, when I was boss of the PJMOL, that's one of the things I introduced. I mean, in fairness, got massive support from Richard Scudamore, the then the CEO of the, uh, of the, of the Premier League, uh, where we would, we would um, 
involved the captain and we had a we had a, a, a basic it, we didn't call it a campaign it was more than a campaign this campaign is only last in football usually about six weeks but this is um this was like get on with the game get on with the game get on with each other get on with the referee mm-hmm. and that and and part of that process was the owners of the club would sign up the captain would sign up the manager would sign up as representatives to say, look, okay, one hour before kickoff, the team sheets come into the dressing room. We want the captains in with the managers or with the co- the, the guy who's going to offer the team sheet. And at that point, we'd say to the referees, look, what we want you to do is just go, my name's Keith. How would you like to be addressed on the field of play to the captain? Mm. You know, fine. And you've broken the ice. And then during the course of the match, if somebody is stepping out of line, I mean, there's a when you coach referees, you talk about the step process in, in management. So the first step, any good referee, any quality referee, is one who does a lot of talking off the ball. You know, you can run alongside a player and say, Look, I want you to improve mm-hmm. your behavior. Or listen, I'm hearing too much. Can you don't point in my direction? You know, if you've got something to say. Say it to me privately. Have you got something to say? No, fine. Let's get on and enjoy the game. That's what I want to do. That's what you want to do. Um, don't take your frustrations out on me. Uh, so that's the first line of that, those quiet words that you develop. Um, it might be to the goalkeeper saying, look, hey, ticking a bit too long, mate. Can you, can you get the ball out a bit quicker? Um, so that if, for example, in that situation, later in the game you caution for time wasting, you can say, well, I did actually tell you. Mm. And maybe after I've spoken to the goalkeeper, I'd run alongside the captain and say, look, I've just had a quiet word with him for you to know he's taking too long, so you can keep an eye on it for me. And then we, we're not going to get into conflict. And or So that's the first, that quiet word. The next one is public. So the public is, look, come and let's have a word. Meet me at, you know, meet me on the triangle. A, B is, you're at A, players at B, come and meet me at C. Come on, come and join me. And at that point, you bring the captain across and say, look, number nine, I'm telling you now, I want an improvement. If I don't get an improvement, it's going to be a different situation. Have you got that, man? Thinking rugby. Um, I, I think, well, you know, when, when I was boss of the PG well, we learned a lot from rugby. You know, I had meetings with rugby people. Uh, the, the, the fact that we got communication kits in football around the world now, because we introduced them to PG well, is because of rugby. I mean, I, I watched a game on TV, listened to a, 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 um, a, ref, a referee called White from England, a uh, really good referee, and then and then I think a few weeks later, I watched a referee called Tony Spedbury. And, and forgive me if I've got the right names wrong, but I suddenly thought their communication is brilliant. I can hear what they're saying. And I, I was invited by the IRB to go to rugby, uh, go to Twickenham and watch a match, which I did. I listened in uh, using a product called RefLink. I was fascinated with what was going on. Someone who hadn't played the game, didn't know the game, but I was being educated. And then I just, I just watched the referees. I mean, I, I mean, this is why I've, I've said all along with VAR, why are we, why, why are we spending such a long time trying to operate it sensibly? All we've got to do is operate it like rugby. Going to you the know, touchline. I, I, yeah, I mean, I watched. Um, a game a couple of years ago and I think it I mean I, I think Nigel Owens is a different class I think he's an outstanding referee great communicator you can learn a lot from him. um you know and uh, but on this occasion I think it was a French referee and there was a shoulder barge tattle that looked pretty like crash at 100 miles an hour and I'm thinking, whoa, that looks a red card. And the crowd were going a bit, saying the game stops. And they go to the big screen and the 
we could hear the, the, the two referee, the two touch judges and the referee. And the touch judges were inclined that it's a red card. And and it might have been Nigel Lawrence, if it come to mind on this occasion. And and it was to the to the guy in the box, could you play that again, please? Could you play that at normal speed? Right, so we're all in anticipation. Two touch judges think it's red. It looks red, right? And his answer was, when they played it, that's rugby. Come on, guys, let's get on. Fantastic. It's rugby. And I just sat back and I went... Um, um, and, you know, I mean, next season, of course, I mean, I, all season I've been bleating about the PGMOL not using IFAB VAR protocols. Um, and I've seen um, the value of VAR undermined because they've not been using it in, a, in the right manner. Lines and offside is one. I've argued that with the pick side monitor because there are subjective decisions in refereeing. And the only guy who's going to make that decision is the referee. He's the man on the field. And what we've had is we've had a number of subjective decisions being made by the man in the room at Stockley Park. Now, what has happened in the effective close season, the IFAB have said on subjective decisions, we expect the pitch side monitor to be looked at by the referee. And I'm pleased to say, well, there's no way Premier League clubs could have been happy with what's happened VAR-wise in England uh, because it was undermining the game, squalling the enjoyment. And, of course, the outcomes were coming out with wrong decisions, <laughs> which, is, which is not what you want. Well, there's that one at Villa Park, wasn't there, when oh, the ball oh, nearly mean, crossed yeah, the line? Yeah, well, that's the most happy thing I've seen. They haven't calibrated uh, the camera. But, um, anyhow, the, the outcome is that the Premier League announced last week that referees will be encouraged to use the pitch side monitor and as I understand it they'll not be using the lines on the offside okay. publicly. Great. I mean the one at Villa Park was of course um, and, I, and I played a massive part in the introduction of goal line technology and I went through all these testing processes uh, because I was the boss at the time and we know that the camera speeds are 500 frames per second. We know that there's seven cameras around each goal, mm -hmm. and they're pretty quick. And we know that they're calibrated before every game. Well, you, you could tell just by what you'd written in the uh, article that I put on the blog of um, just the frustration of you've put all of this in place, you've implemented it, you've gone through all of the rigmarole of getting it all prepared, and then it's just doesn't work and it, it, it must just be so frustrating. <laughs> well, I think that, um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not, yeah, at the time I was really upset because I know how the system works fully. I know the battle we had. Look, we were, we were, we were a good year getting the system to work. I mean, all kinds of system work from day one, but the whole thing was to get it down to less than a second. And of course, the argument then was, I don't want, I don't want humans around it. Because you know, yeah. imme immediately you introduce a human being, you've got a split opinion. Yeah. I want it yeah. to say judgment. And of course, there are things that people are not aware of. I mean, the fact that goalposts in the Premier League, you know, the argument was cameras in goalposts. That's the answer. Why don't we have that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the goalposts are not vertical and parallel. They're like that. that. And the other thing is, the shape of the ball goes out of sphere. It's spherical when it's kicked. It goes almost like a balloon. It's quite an amazing sight when you see it with a high-speed camera. So as a result, the, the, the computer system takes the back of the line and shoots it up in, in the computer software system does that brilliant piece of technology and of course what happens is it captures the outer circumference of the ball captures the speed at which the ball is traveling computes the point and and therefore you've got a computed view and 
you know, 99 point whatever percentage accuracy it will give you. So for 5,000 plus games, it's worked brilliantly. On the, the one Aston Villa Sheffield United, it didn't. And my frustration always, you know, when I brought the communication kits in, I said, great, now what we've got to understand is these will fail. They will fail. And, you know, very quickly with the communication kits, I might have said it before, we had the problem at Chelsea where for some unknown reason, uh, Chelsea, we would get, during the course of the match, in the earpiece of the referee, you would get, uh, we wanted a taxi to go to Kensington High Street, you know? <laughs> and you see the referee look around and think, what's happened here? And then, of course, with amusement, they tell you, well, I'm refereeing a football match, I don't need this system to tell me it wants a taxi cab in Kensington High Street or whatever. Uh, so we had to overcome that with encryption and various other things. With goal line technology, we, we, we had to ensure that we were getting not only speed of accuracy, uh, but also, um, you know, without, without sort of physical interference. You know, but as, as I used, I, I used to call this, I used to say, look guys, I'm introducing the technology, right? And this is no different to, to a jet aircraft. You're going to have that level of quality of technical competence behind mm -hmm. it. Funnily enough, in a jet aircraft that's flown by the Air Force, they have an ejector seat. Why do they have an ejector seat, I wonder? Because at some point, technology goes wrong. They did that, day. Because they're in the air, the pilot needs to come out. What we need to understand is, if technology goes wrong, how are you prepared and how are you going to cope? Because that's what the point of the training. So Michael Oliver, you know, an outstanding referee. He's at the match. He's got an assistant referee who stood on the goal line in the best position ever. And they must have got a reasonable view. But he, under the criteria, is discouraged, right? from flagging. And what you're doing is you're saying, actually, you don't apply common sense. So, so the, the, the question I posed to somebody a couple of weeks ago was, well, if he's on the line, and if he's on the, on the goal line, and he's in ideal position, he sees the ball cross the line, you're saying to him, don't flag. Well, why should he be on the goal line? Mm. What's he there for then? Let him stand somewhere else. Let him stand at the halfway line and talk to his mate. He's less lonely. Um, so I think sometimes we don't think through. So in that case, with all that's going off, Michael Oliver might have said, just a minute, and hopefully if it happens next season, it won't, but if it did, he might say, I think I'll just have a look at the pitch side monitor. My boss is now allowing me to do that, whereas before, his boss wasn't. Hmm. His boss was saying, well, you know, we're going to use the pitch side monitor sparingly. Well, he is a former accountant. He knows numbers. Yeah. Mike Riley knows numbers. I know numbers. I know that if you go to the pitch side monitor three times in a season that has 380 games, then something's not quite right. You're actually saying to me, this is what you're saying, but you're not doing it in practice. Don't pull my leg. It's amazing it's only been three times. Because well, it's, 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 it's common sense to use that pitch side monitor. It's there for a reason. It's just gathering it's dust. For a reason. Yeah, I mean, look, yeah, I've, I've sat in front of 20 of the, wor uh, you know, the world's top referees. The PGMOL produced, have produced some really top class referees. Hmm. You know, and, I, and I've seen debate from you know, Graham Paul, Graham Barber, Paul Durkin, Howard Webb, Jeff Winter, you know, Paul Regier, uh, you know, all all outstanding match officials or whatever the officiating time. And the debate where I've played a video clip, you know, we've not got agreement because it's in the opinion of. And therefore, the, on subjective decisions, I've said from day one, that's what the pitch side monitor is there for. Mm. 
and therefore, um, yeah, you, you don't want them, what you don't want is them abdicating the responsibility and saying, I need to check everything. Mm. But that, the, the VAR protocol already does that because it says, actually, we only want you involved in penalty kicks, goals, um, red cards, and mistaken identity, so, and offside. So it's got a very clear remit for that very purpose to stop too much interference. But we should also forget the, the fact that, you know, the argument is it's taking too long. In reality, it's because they've got nothing to see. Yeah. It, it, it looks long. Because it takes just as long for a free kick. In fact, on a, on a free set piece free kick, it takes a lot longer. There's more time lost in the game on goal kicks and set piece free kicks and throw-ins from the wrong position than yeah. goal line technology. But it's because we're, we're suddenly like, here comes a point of conflict and here's something I don't believe and I'm not involved in the process. And therefore, the other argument that I put forward very strongly is I, I see no reason why we don't follow the rugby union uh, and allow the, the review, if you like, to be on the big screen. Yeah. If, it's, if, they, if, if the referee can't see it, right, yeah. then he shouldn't be refereeing, should he? That's it's true. It's a fair enough point. I, I think that I don't think it'd be a good idea at all to have it up on a big screen. But I think that because I remember there was something at Tottenham against Manchester United, and they showed the highlights of the first half at half time, and it showed I think Ronaldo made a foul, and it should have been a sending off or something, and and it was shown, and the Spurs fans were irate. So I think that it could cause a lot of problems. Well, I, I think I'm talking about the specific review. Oh, like in American football, say where they show it, and well, yeah. So like rugby, and rugby. If there is a if there is a point of conflict in the game, mm. like in rugby, somebody sideswipes somebody with a right hand punch, right, mm. and they play it, and you go right, you're off. Mm. We see it. What's the difference? Yeah, that's yeah, that's that yeah. could like that should work for I think for certain. Yeah, I'm, only, I'm not, you know, um, yeah. I, I mean, the old the old argument has been right along. If it's a point of conflict, you know, in a game, we're not going to show it on the big screen. Hmm. Yeah. But then I mean, you see it on match I mean, at ten thirty that night. No, you've gone. You can, if they want to show it. But listen, I've got a mobile phone. Mm. I can replay it. I can look at it mm. instantly on my mobile phone. Right. So what's the difference? Yeah. I still think that there would be a lot of controversial decisions that would then get... It, it, it could potentially cause more bo bother than it's worth and being a fan in the crowd would then get worked up a lot by the situation but well my 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 view is slightly at odds with you chris on the basis that if if it's on the big screen yeah. that might that might prevent the player from diving that That's might true, prevent the guy that might prevent the guy from having a punch or spitting at an opponent yeah you know the diving well, aspect of things might I say, it might say you know why is our play being sent off because we didn't see the challenge but then when you see the challenge on the screen it verifies that the, that player should have been sent off yeah I, I, I do agree with you on that I think and the, the bit you mentioned about the diving I think that that's one of my pet hates within the game of players diving and if it well, was shown we, it would we really we, we know the divers are, don't we? Mm. We really do in the game. If, we, if we're watching football, we know that Jack Grealish dies. We know that Zaha of uh, uh, Palace and he yeah. dives. Yeah. We, we know more Salah dives. Mm. Yeah. We know Deeney dives. Do I go on? Mm. I'm not watching them every week. I'm just watching the highlights. And, and isn't that, are, are we. 
Yes. Oh, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here, but I don't know why we've suddenly gone off. I've got plenty of power. Yeah, I've got uh, 16%, <laughs> so I'm hanging in there. Hold on. What we could do is we could stop it there into the third interview if you fancy doing that, Keith. Yeah, we'll stop it there and then um, and then do another one later on, eh? Yeah, definitely. And then we can get uh, right. talk about Trevelyan and things like that as well, can't we? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Brilliant. great. Yeah. Fine. Well, we can do a third one very soon then. Okay, mate. Take care. Brilliant. Bye. Bye-bye.